First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Steve Shields. I'm with Marine Bank and Trust. I'm the Chief Residential Lending Officer. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for coming out this morning. I know we're all very busy with our schedules, so I truly appreciate you coming out. This is our third annual economic presentation. And as you can see, uh, this event grows every year. So I'm very humbled uh, for the turnout and the fact that you've uh, given us the time in your busy schedule. Before I introduce our featured speaker, I would also like to express a, a sincere thank you to Kevin Given and his staff here at Quail Valley. Uh, without um, them, this event would not be possible. His staff has done a tremendous job in helping us set up, so thank you, Kevin. At this juncture, I'd also like to introduce our president and CEO, Bill Penny. It's the team marine philosophy uh, that we give back to the community, and these events uh, are evident of that fact. I would also like to introduce our board of directors that are here in attendance today. They are David Kroom of Kroom Construction, Rusty Banak, Aaron Grawl, would also like to say congratulations to Aaron on her re-election, and Kevin Given, director of Quail Valley. At this point, I'd also like to ask the Marine Bank and Trust team to stand up. I have the pleasure of working with these individuals on a daily basis, and it is a true pleasure that these women and men are true bankers. They give back to this community in various ways. Their knowledge of the marketplace is unparalleled, and that's what makes Marine Bank Trust different. That's why we're better. We're going 21 years in this community as Bureau's only true community bank. I'm very proud of that fact. Now, on to the introduction of Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook has over 30 plus years of leadership and business experience. And so the challenge is taking a biography such as that, that is so lengthy, uh, and shrinking it down to uh, a small little bio. So <laughs> I will do my best, sir. Starting with his education, Mr. Cook was educated at St. John's College, known to many Americans as Oxford University, where he had. He attained his master's degree from the London Graduate School of Business. Then he went on to achieve his master's degree in psychology from the University of London. After a successful 15-year run with the UK's major consultancy, he became the national partner for Bender, Hamlin, and one of the big eight accounting firms for the United Kingdom. His experience with these companies led to his creation of a new form of one-on-one -on -one coaching that launched his business leadership career in the 1980s. Mr. Cook is known as one of the founding fathers of business coaching in Europe. He worked exclusively for one European Union administration and three United Kingdom administrations, in particular working very closely with Margaret Thatcher. Mr. Cook has taken his business leadership and lessons from working on the government level to correlating these lessons of history in a geopolitically challenged environment. In short, Mr. Cook has a passion. He considers himself an educator. And he takes the lessons of history and he turns them into geopolitically charged questions. On a personal note, Mr. Cook has been married over 25 years to his American wife, Noelle. She introduced Mr. Cook to Vero Beach in the late 1980s. Now a permanent resident of Johns Island, the Cooks now call Vero Beach their home since 2010. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Mr. James Cook to the stage. Thank 
Everyone keeps asking me about Europe. Can they ever get their act together? And what should the American stance be? And every time I find I have to go back in history, I have to tell them things that they don't know, that explain the situation today and prepare us to be in a position to look ahead to the future. So now you're going to hear it all. The massive history that leads up to where we stand today. And then I'd like to take your questions and let that rip. Europe stretches from the Atlantic coastline of Ireland, Portugal, and Spain in the west to the Russian border in the east. For most of the 19th century, Russia would have been included as part. But ever since 1917, when Lenin took the train ride from his hiding place back to Moscow, this has been a stubborn outsider, a hollow country beset by a hollow set of values whose only interest has been to meddle, interfere, and reduce the happiness and success of its culturally rich neighbors. Russia will play a part through this story as a disgraceful pariah. Its shadow hangs over Europe still, and the further east and south you look, the more significant is its negative gloom. And one other nation, not part of the European Union, will also play a role in this, the nation of Turkey. This increasingly Muslim republic of some 80 millions is the strategic link between southeastern Europe and North Africa. But let's start just by looking directly at the European Union. Let's size it up and compare it as best I can with us here in the United States. The 50 states here are physically larger. 3.8 million square miles is against the 2 million square miles of the European Union, but with only 326 millions. We are significantly smaller in terms of population. The EU has a total of 512 millions. Average P GDP per capita is close to $59,000 here against 42,000 in the European Union. Luxembourg has an income of $105,000 per capita, roughly twice that of the United States. We're on a par with the Netherlands. There is, however, a gulf in wealth between the richer nations to the north and the west of Europe, and those poorer nations to the south and to the east. Those in the north enjoy our income levels, around about the $50,000 per capita mark whereas those to the east and south suffer from levels less than half of this, typically around $18,000. The poorest is Bulgaria, at just around $8,000. The first conclusion, the European Union is large in terms of population, but it is a disparate collection of economies. Let's just look a little bit more closely at the EU and the United States. We are our own best customers. Total trade in all goods and services amounts to $1.2 trillion per annum. The United States has a slight balance of payments de deficit, balance of trade deficit. It's around 90 billions. It's insignificant, almost an error factor in such a vast arena of statistics. Either the EU or the United States is the largest trade and investment partner for almost all the countries on the globe. Together, we account for half of world GDP. Furthermore, the cultural wealth of the 28 nations within the EU today is so massive, its history so rich, its artistic record so deep as to be a source of endless wonder, pleasure, study, and recreation. Just to review the region's cultural contribution is to travel from ancient Greece through Rome to Venice 
to the Spain of Columbus, to Florence and the Renaissance, to the Reformation and Bruges, and ultimately to Paris and London. Europe matters today almost as much as the United States at both geopolitical, economic, and cultural levels. It is manifestly worth supporting, worth getting right, and worth building as part of the fabric of a future civilization seeking peace, health, and cooperation. But at this point, the happy similarities with the United States stop being so self-evident because Europe is facing a crisis. Nationalism, racism, xenophobia, economic vulnerability, and the emotional weight of a terrible history is finding a new populist voice that is drowning out cool thought and long-term planning. In a nutshell, the big lie, adapted to suit whichever audience it may be, is gaining credence, especially amongst those who are most vulnerable, those who count themselves amongst the have-nots. These people, a significant part of any economy, have been bypassed economically. And they feel they've been victimized by the policymakers. There has been a slow and steady economic improvement in overall economic performance across the region. But significant as this has been, it has entirely failed to relieve the desperate poor, to help the weakest nations enough or stem the tide of popular resentment against the apparently uncaring institutions, bureaucracies, and politicians. The established political leadership has failed to appreciate the implications of this resentment amongst what amounts at least to a highly significant minority of voters. It's perhaps not too much of an exaggeration to say that no amount of worthiness, of good intentions, or of scholarship amongst the established leadership has been able to offset their almost total lack of grasp that the political imperatives have moved towards rewarding the masses better to a fairer distribution of wealth. The choice today is either a new democratic socialism or a no less polarized, despotic, centralized rule. Next, Viktor Orban of Hungary with our friend Putin. This lack of touch, by the way, is not new. It was encapsulated by Harold Macmillan's, Macmillan, Britain's prime minister in the late 50s, whose election slogan to a recession-torn Britain was the entirely hypocritical, you've never had it so good. And it won his election. By contrast to Europe, the United States has some special strengths. It remains a robust federation. The petrodollar is still the world's currency. And this country is hardly beset by significant external threats, however much the administration tries to talk up the challenge from China. Above all, this is a nation that has never experienced invasion or a hostile war on its own soil. But the history of Europe is very different. And it makes for an emotional tinderbox. Nationalism there is a dangerous and potent poison. Samuel Johnson called it the last refuge of the scoundrel. Bernard Shaw said, we'll never have a quiet world till you knock nationalism out of the human race. Let me just pause there with you for a moment. The European Union has recognized and embraced globalism and the complex world of international political and economic interdependence, just as have the world's major corporations. But individual electorates have not done this so wholeheartedly. In particular, those with the weakest education, the weakest earning power, have resisted the shift in thinking and they have lost out badly. They have remained insular, Luddite, and welcoming those who play back their anger to them. New Age populist politicians, this is Viktor Orban again of Hungary with Matteo Salvini of Italy, have emerged 
prepared to pander to this electorate, to inspire and engage its fears, however unfounded they may be, of technology, terrorism, immigrants, and especially immigrants coming up from Africa or coming in from Asia. Above all, the European leaders managed the 2008 financial crisis to the detriment of their taxpayers, their voters, and in particular, their poor. They lit a fuse beneath that tinderbox. And today, we're at a tipping point, a point of rising tension between an understanding that the world really has gone global in the last five years and a knee-jerk reaction that seeks to avoid facing this real challenge. Europe is in a crisis of transition, one that will continue until a leadership emerges that can address this tension. Now, to understand this complex and surprising state of affairs that has seemed to emerge suddenly over the last two, three, four, five years, I want to review some of the important dates, the structural foundation that leads up to where we are today and helps us to look at how Europe has mismanaged its geoeconomic challenge. Come with me now to remind ourselves of the terrible history that has molded the challenges of today. We could say that modern Europe, certainly its subliminal memory, began on October the 21st, 1805, when 27 ships of the line, led by Admiral of the Fleet Lord Nelson aboard HMS Victory, defeated 33 French, we, love, we Brits love to talk like this, 33 French and Spanish vessels off the south coast of Spain at Trafalgar. Not for a century would Britain be challenged again at sea. The British Empire followed with an engine of wealth, and this is the important point, far from the continental mainland of Europe. The channel <coughs> would serve throughout as an impenetrable defense. In geopolitical terms, it allowed us always to remain hesitant about our true allegiance to the European cause. We're going to come to Brexit, obviously, later. It allowed us to be hesitant about our commitment to the continent of Europe, to play the options, to sit on the fence. Churchill was proud of Britain's special relationship with you, with America, what he paint, rather um, patronizingly called the New World. But he focused his real passion on our empire. Though an enthusiast for Europe, he spoke of their rather than our challenge. For Mrs. Thatcher, there was never a serious question of an alternative to British sovereignty. Frankly, she saw much of the debate as an entirely idealistic flim-flam. She said to me one day with irritation, can we stop these constant references to European unity? It'll never come about. Britain would suffer alongside its neighbors during two world wars. But we were never invaded either. Psychologically, our eyes were always set on our empire elsewhere and on our special relationship with you, with the United States. But the nations on the continental mainland were to suffer an altogether different experience. And we need to understand that today. The Napoleonic Wars of the turn of the 19th century set the pattern. We hear today of the period as one of French glory, romance, genius. But reality was very different. Whilst British trade doubled between 1796 and 1816, France ran out of funds and ran out of manpower, as it endured its revolution. And then under Napoleon, a series of massive land battles that broke the back of its manhood. 12,000 died at Friedland, 44,000 at Aspen, and then 300,000 in Spain, 450,000 in the Russian campaign, 200,000 at Leipzig, and so on. One million men, 30% of France's manhood killed. 
Few historians remark how by Waterloo in 1815, like Hitler in 1945, Napoleon had all but run out of experienced soldiery. He too was using children as conscripts. Napoleon's legacy to Europe was one of death, destruction, and despotism. Most of modern day Europe didn't even exist in the 19th century. Germany was just a collection of states and principalities within the far larger empire of Austria-Hungary, which together with the Ottoman and Russian empires kept a lid to a greater or lesser extent on internal revolution, civil wars, tribalism, and terrorism. That was all to change with the efforts of Bismarck in the 1870s as the Prussian Chancellor created the new nation of Germany. Bismarck recognized the yawning differences between the cultures, the geographies, <coughs> the histories of the component states, differences that remain to this day and lie behind much of the current leadership problems in that country, in particular between Angela Merkel and her coalition partners. Bismarck was convinced that a new patriotic war would be the best means of covering up these differences, and who better than with the eternal enemy, France. So the gauntlet was thrown. Her generals reassured Emperor Napoleon III of France that France would win, and off they all went to war on August the 19th, 1870. It was over in five months. That's Bismarck. But those short lived, the toll was heavy. 117,000 Germans, 760,000 French lay dead. Humiliated, the French ego was in tatters, and here's the thing. The ripples of humiliation would last to today. France was forced to hand over Alsace and Lorraine in reparations. These were lands that in their turn France would seize back at the end of World War I in 1918, and which would then form part of Hitler's justification for warmongering in the 1930s as he sought to claim back what he saw as the rightful German country. And so at the start of the 20th century, Britain is happily ruling the waves, London is the financial capital of the world, Paris, despite the 1870s, is the cultural center, and Berlin, Munich, and its other great cities in Germany are building a new economy. But elsewhere, a different, insidious, and dangerous economic trend was starting to emerge. While those nations in the West and the North were prospering, the further East and South you traveled, the more subsistent, <coughs> so I skipped that, here we are, the more subsistent and uncompetitive were the economies. The old empires of Austria, Hungary, Ottoman, and Russia were exhausted. They had failed to take advantage of the Industrial Revolution. They had failed to adapt. They were living on borrowed time, on myths that would then be shattered by the two world wars. 20 millions died in the fighting, <coughs> between 1914 and 1918, and then a further 20 millions in the Spanish flu epidemic that followed. But what is <coughs> often ignored is that the killings did not stop with the armistice in 1918. Throughout Europe, and especially the further east and south you went, the killings continued and they would mold the psyche of nations as they strive to cooperate and survive today. Any understanding of Europe must include these terrible and ongoing local wars. Social upheavals, reprisals, religious and tribal killings, they continued throughout the period what Churchill called the unknown wars, a period that stretched with greater or lesser pain from 1918 to the end of the 1930s, and a further 10 million died. More villages <coughs> and towns were laid waste. New hatreds and resentments were created. 
there were no empire high commands to keep the peace. All of the emperors had been slain or deposed. Instead, all sides, victors and vanquished, alike were ruined. All were defeated. Everything had been given in vain. Nothing was gained by anyone. Remember, we're talking east and south here. And those that survived, the exhausted veterans of countless battle days, returned wherever recognized or not, alone to their homes, engulfed in catastrophe. The challenge to individuals was in their poverty, their loneliness, and their lack of opportunity. There was no hiding place. Instead, more than 27 violent exchanges of political power, civil wars, thank you so much. And ongoing actions of terror in just the five years following the end of World War I. Some, like Churchill, confronted the reality. Nobel laureate W.B. Yeats <coughs> wrote in a contemporary poem, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. All these nations were new and economically and politically vulnerable. <coughs> and let's give them some real credit. They were tough too. Just consider Poland's immediate geopolitical actions after its formation in 1919. It agreed a special status for its predominantly German-speaking port of Danzig. It quelled disputes with its Russian-speaking citizens in what has become Greater Poland. <coughs> it squashed four uprisings amongst Silesian and East Prussian minorities and coped furthermore with six different border wars involving Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, and Soviet Russia itself. These were no small actions. Part of the role of the European NATO membership today is to act as a physical buffer to Russia. The immense support given to Europe by Truman and the Marshall Plan was given not just to help Germany rebuild, but to hold the line against the Iron Curtain. What was to become a NATO initiative was a role first articulated by Poland in the 1920s. It was its victory at the Battle of Warsaw over the newly formed Soviet army that convinced Lenin once and for all to stay with his, in his own country. All of these new nations <coughs> needed new structures, new institutions, new identities to help them cope with the responsibility of governing. In the main, their populations were small. They endured subsistence agriculture. They had little industry. They were struggling throughout to accommodate a new, and this is going to be an important theme, complex ethnic trend. Sticking with Poland for a moment and judged by its census in 1931, 60% Polish, 10% German, 10% Lithuanian, 10% Russian, and 10% Czech. For them all, nationhood was a priority the imperative economic survival. Unemployment in Europe at the time has been estimated at 25%. And as with all the other statistics, everything gets worse the further east and south you go. <coughs> and then came the crash of the New York stock market of 1929. When in July 1933, the index stopped falling, 25% of American workforce was out of a job. But the world, remember, had gone global. The United States Depression hit Europe like a sledgehammer. In Germany, 9 million out of a 20 million workforce, nearly 50% were out of work. In three years, Germany's economy declined by 16%, Poland by 18%, Austria by 22%. Remember, all new countries. Russian communists pretended to foster a new populist, if entirely misleading, sensitivity to their struggle. They gave a voice to the have-nots and so remained a constant thorn in the sides of the new democracies, in no way helping to resolve the pain of poverty, always pretending to offer a solution. The new governments were challenged and the results were there to see in nation after nation. Dictatorships <coughs> emerged in Hungary, Austria, Latvia, Poland, Spain, and Portugal. 
And then in 1933, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany and drove his country and Europe to a war on the groundswell of nationalism, racism, and xenophobia. And so World War II ushered in a repeat of the whole terrible process, the killings, destruction, <coughs> suffering, all over. Only this time there was the added dimension of Stalin and the USSR. Poland, for example, invaded and occupied first by Nazi Germany and then communist Russia. And once again, historians have ignored the aftermath of 1945, because once again the war did not end with Hitler's defeat. Nothing like. Especially again in the East and the South, civil wars continued to rage as they had done 15 years earlier. There was fighting in the Ukraine and in the Baltic states well into the 50s. Most countries record fighting until the last Soviet soldier left. 1989 in Poland and a couple of years later, 1991, for Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. This aftermath saw one other unexpected, largely ignored event that will echo down the hallways of history to this day. Many of the newly formed nations seeking to emphasize their identity effectively <clears throat> took the earlier racial efforts of the Nazis to their logical conclusion and expelled all those who were not indigenous. Tens of millions were forcibly, often violently expelled in the hidden, but nonetheless biggest act of ethnic cleansing the world has ever seen. The culture of racial diversity that had been so rich a feature of the European empires was now dealt a final death blow. And the first target, of course, was the Germans. Murdered, tortured, expelled from all non-German countries. Tens of thousands died from malnutrition and disease. In all, more than 12 million indigenous Germans were expelled from the new nations to the east, in particular Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Romania. Destitute, homeless, without an identity. There were hundreds of thousands in refugee camps in the mid-50s. The ongoing, ongoing death toll was enormous. Towns with German-sounding names were renamed. In schools, new patriotic songs were sung, new national histories taught, populist slogans, Poland for the Polish, Hungary first, and so on. This talk is about the crisis facing Europe today and the massive part that history makes in the cumulative formation of the psyche of a nation. It is <coughs> highly significant that it was not only the Germans who were expelled from hitherto multiracial countries where they had in many cases lived for generations, lived well and belonged. Remember between 1914 and 1945, all these nations had fought each other. Now was the time for revenge, for wholesale cleansing and for bitter and small reckonings. The Slovaks expelled Hungarians, as did Romania. Albanians were driven out of Greece, Italy from Yugoslavia, Turks from Bulgaria. Eastern Europe, by 1950, was a vast churn of refugees, lost peoples, amid increasingly xenophobic, ethnically concentrated and hostile states. The emotional memory was set for the big lie today, a rejection of foreigners, of immigrants, of people who might not be like us, and an introverted focus on ourselves to the exclusion of others. Never underestimate the pull of a terrible history such as this. Let me just summarize the story through the experience of one little country, of Latvia. Today, it's a sovereign state in the Baltic region of Northern Europe. After centuries of Swedish, Polish, and Russian rule, it was forcibly incorporated back into the USSR, invaded by Nazi Germany in 1941, and then reoccupied by the Soviets in 1944. It won back its independence in 1992. Today, Latvia, 
with a little population of two million, is a rapidly developing country and its lovely capital, Riga, was the European city of culture in 2014. But its history, its proud resistance, will never be forgotten. Every five years in July, and stretching back through this period nearly 150 years, the persecuted Latvians have kept their hopes alive and reminded themselves of their original identity through seven days of music and song. It's called the Singing Revolution, a reawakening of their national consciousness, a deeply emotional, frankly heart-rending event that this year drew 500,000 Latvians to take part. Almost the whole of the adult population turned up. Nations care about their histories, whether they be large or small. Over the last 20 years or so, Latvia, a buffer state if ever there was one, has benefited from the protection of NATO as it, is encouraged, as it has encountered <coughs> the nagging disruptions from Russia. At the same time, it has benefited from the trade assurance of its membership of the Euro Euro European Union. Its GDP is still only $15,000 per head, but it's growing at a healthy 4%. And it's done well in employment terms. It's inherited 40% youth unemployment under Russian rule. And this has now come down to below 10% in 2018. Russian provocations remain an everyday way of life. The little country still needs all the support the Western alliances <coughs> can give. The European Union itself had a lengthy incubation period. As far back as 1918, the Allies at Versailles, led by your American President Woodrow Wilson there on the right, was already concerned to stop forever this pattern of war, reparations, vengeance and destruction. Woodrow Wilson, more than a century ahead of his time, proposed <coughs> a League of Nations, but it was not to be. Clemenceau and the French were still thirsting for revenge, and Lloyd George and the British, well, we were just tired and depressed. Lloyd George left Paris as soon as he could, saying, we'll have to do the whole thing again in 25 years. Too weak, too late, no less prophetic for all that. Without their resolve, Wilson, alas, couldn't command the support from an isolationist, isolationist America safely enjoying life 3,000 miles away, nor, for that matter, from a Briton still sitting on the fence. It wasn't until 1951 that the concept of a European trade area was established in the form of a coal and steel community. And it had just six members, all from the north and the west, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and Netherlands. The European Union today has grown to be a community of 28 nations. It has survived the Cold War it's helped to bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union. It has been a monumental achievement, a powerhouse of trade and technology, and a massive force for good in the world. It is understood that the heart of economic growth is the free flow of goods and people, and the no less free flow of technology, and it has worked. Half of the members were enjoying a real GDP growth rate last year of 3%. It has championed important areas of innovation in environmental protection, healthcare, education, and in energy. Any, any product manufactured in one country can be sold to any other member without tariffs or duties. It has embraced globalization. It has a common currency, the euro. The everyday <coughs> value of the euro compared to the United States dollar, the unofficial world currency, is the most widely watched currency relationship. But there we stop. There we start to see some of the challenges being faced by the Union today. In fact, only 19 members have so far converted to the Euro. Great Britain, still conflicted, still on the fence, has remained protective of Sterling and of London as the de facto financial capital of Europe. Britain has all along been a country divided socially, economically, and geographically. Roughly half the nation is in favor of Europe. And they are in the main the youngest, the best educated, 
They live in London and the South and increasingly enjoy the new international jobs market, the travel and the access <coughs> to different, often brilliant cultures, histories and environments that are now easily available to them. But the other 50% have remained sensitive to their own local cultures and to nationhood. They've come to resent any threat to their hard-won independence. At its worst, those pro-Europe are caricatured as faddish and supercilious winos and the little Englanders as fascist soccer hooligans. On June the 23rd, 2016, this stopped being a joke. The Prime Minister, the self-serving and myopic David Cameron, made an historic miscalculation and allowed the Brexit referendum, which he then bungled and lost. The politicians were at their best worthy. At worst, ill-briefed, <coughs> ill-coordinated, dishonest, and lacking in any ability to communicate with the general voter. It's hard to see any robust leadership. Immigration and the cost of membership became part of the new big lie. A Harvard study recently showed the British perceiving Im immigrants as forming nearly 40% of the population. The real figure is 12%. Typically, immigrant numbers in the UK, mostly from the Commonwealth, had run at around about 60,000 a year. And it was true that as more countries joined the EU, so the numbers climbed of those seeking work in the more prosperous UK. We developed our home <coughs> in London using Polish workers. They were cheaper, better educated, and better motivated than their London competitors. So in 2013, there were 200,000 immigrants, and there were nearly 300,000 in 2014. But for a population in excess of 70 million, 300,000 is hardly a statistically relevant number. And Britain's leaders should have pointed to our rich and proud history as a multiracial community, to the Commonwealth and to Europe and to the well-reported value added they had created. Quite apart from our little domestic build in Fulham, the National Health Service would grind to immediate halt, but for the superb and well-educated and committed immigrant doctors, nurses and support staff. The second lie was the colossal cost of British membership. The right-wing fascist party UKIP quoted 25 billions a year. But by the time Mrs. Thatcher had finished the negotiations, the actual figure was less than a third of that, it's six billion, and that's before allowing for the huge gains by the competitive UK economy and the city of London in particular. Overall, we have benefited hugely. <clears throat> the ill-prepared British politicians dithered and capitulated. They didn't have the stomach for the fight and they missed the real point. Efficiency and population growth in the UK was falling, as it is in the United States. Efficiency, though, in the UK is now around 25% below that of Germany. Britain needs population growth. Economics matter. Cameron's resigned and left behind a Westminster split every which way and wholly unprepared for the consequences of its ill-considered folly in allowing the referendum in the first place. If ever a charismatic leader was needed, it was now. But instead of a new Churchill or a Thatcher, Britain is led, if that's the right word, by the entirely uncharismatic Theresa May. It's in serious trouble and looks determined to stay there. It's only now appreciating that it must leave by March 2019. It has very little time. Airbus, the European aerospace giant, has recently warned it will leave the country. Growth in business investment has fallen by 50% since 2015. Neither of the British parties has a relevant developed strategy. Politicians in Britain have become more populist as they perceive the futility of their situation. Populist politicians are a dangerous breed of cat. Brought up and familiar with the soundbite with Twitter, how to use, even abuse, the often naively directed power of the media. They use the language of the street to reach the street. 
Today, the debate is increasingly negative. Britain has built, was built on the acceptance and richness of a multiracial population, enjoyed as part of the legacy of our empire, and it needs this population today as never before as part of its economic strategy. Britain is important to this European story because of all, for all my criticism, Britain remains a lead nation. It sets an example. It has broken the mold and it cannot be ignored. And just in case we think that we here, 3,000 miles away, can take a flippant attitude to this mess, remember this matters here too. <coughs> United States companies have been Britain's largest investors. You've invested more than half a trillion dollars and you employ more than one million people there. How these negotiations go matters, and we should be no less interested from the point of view of our relations with Europe itself, your largest trading partner. And in ending, I'm going to come and address where they stand. The first members all belonged, remember, to the affluent North and the West. However, <coughs> this is one of the big moments in European history, political, <coughs> political thinking evolved. And by the early 1980s, the Commission suddenly, and I believe quite wrongly, saw its role as becoming a political one to include all European countries. A geopolitical drive overcame economic reality. They called it enlargement. And protagonists saw enlargement as valuable in its own right. Greece joined in 1981. Spain and Portugal in 1986, and then in 2004, after the Berlin Wall had come down, 12 nations mostly freed from the yoke of Russia. These brought with them the tragic histories I've been outlining at such detail. Ethnic cleansing <coughs> that meant that two of those nations today, even today, remain virtually monoracial. Poland and Romania, like Japan, have almost no foreign-born citizens. Greece, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, hardly any. Most of these new members were economically at risk. Youth unemployment, around 10% here in the United States, overall 20% in the EU, is over 32% in Italy, and over 40% in Spain. I think I've jumped ahead of myself. And Greece. And the internal economic differences between the north and south of Italy, for example, riving, splitting apart Italy today, or between Barcelona and Madrid in Spain, or as is now emerging in Prussia, <coughs> between Prussia and Bavaria in Germany. These reflect pockets of extreme and dangerous poverty, as well as those long-standing cultural differences we're talking about wars, lost generations, internal resentments, a recipe for civil unrest and a social petri dish for extremism and emotional populism. The promise of European membership was not just freedom from Russia. It was also a promise of gainful employment, a fast track to joining the other haves, an affluent life. But the EU leaders, their eyes on enlargement lent money to countries with little opportunity for growth, let alone for levels of profitability that would allow them to pay back the debts they embraced to kickstart their economies and give their peoples a shot at a new affluence. They all failed to develop the fiscal structures and infrastructure to allow them <coughs> to weather economic storms. 2008 and its aftermath ravaged the new states especially those who were the poorest, and not one banker, Pace, all these lovely bankers here today, not one banker, bureaucrat, or political head rolled. So despite the achievements, it's not difficult to paint another picture of the EU experiment as one of economic and social failure. A group of countries unable to resolve the debt burden. Of Greece, with a debt 180% of their current income. Of Italy, 131% of their current income. 
of GDP, or of the other nine countries with debts over 80%. And we have inevitably to come back to immigration. This is a boat on the Mediterranean. Don't forget all that ethnic cleansing. The foreign-born population of Europe in 2014 was 33 million, only 7% of the total population. But already fences had been constructed between Turkey and Greece to withstand the migrants escaping the wars in the Middle East and the desertification caused by that other global phenomenon, climate change. Global warming across North Africa, destroying historic ways of life, which will not pause for local politicians in rich Europe. The European response has not been elegant. The Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi of the time created a shameless private deal with Libya to return migrants, measures that violated the policies of the European Convention of Human Rights, as do the most recent efforts by Hungary, Poland, Austria and Italy to resist the migrants still coming from Syria, Somalia and the Sudan. One million in 2015. But bureaucrats making rules is one thing. Nations dealing with a crisis is quite another. And Europe has done little. It is procrastinated. Turkey, the bridge between Europe and North Africa, and the eye of the storm has acted very differently. And it may be a precursor to what we're going to see. President Erdo Erdogan, man on the right there, has driven his grip on power and overseen a crackdown. The leader of the opposition is in jail. Lawyers, judges, civil servants and journalists are threatened under a cobbled state of emergency declared two years ago. This has already meant the detention without any form of, of uh, trial of an estimated 140,000 people, the closure of 189 media outlets and the arrest of more than 300 journalists. Erdogan's eyes <coughs> have moved increasingly towards Putin and Russia. His aim is to forge a totalitarian state to combat immigration, to constrain learning, education, free thought and change. Turkey is evolving into an Islamic dictatorship. There are three million Syri Syrian refugees in camps in Turkey and they will be returned home. Turkey has declared war on the Kurds. The lira has dropped 40%. National debt is out of control. Erdogan, Erdogan is becoming more ferocious. But just so I don't sound too pious here, this is difficult. It's hard not to sympathize with the resentment of unemployed young people in Tuscany, where Noel and I were only recently, when you see these youngsters in those medieval squares and milling around, lounging about, refugees from North Africa. Europe is facing a man-sized challenge. In Germany, the ponderous and uncharismatic Merkel has failed a serious challenge from her vocal right-wing Bavarian coalition partner, Horst Seehofer. And of course, from both the fascist front and from the Green Party, who at least are concerned about global warming. In France, Macron, now at a historic low in popularity, is confronted by the threat of Marie Le Pen and her fascist followers. In Italy, the new Prime Minister Giuseppe Conti and Interior Minister Salvini, he's the one on the left, have introduced a populist government. Salvini has commandeered the political conversation, adding an attack on the small Roma population. This is, of course, all part of his big lie. Salvini's real challenge <coughs> is that his beautiful country is economically divided between the rich north and the poor south. 8% and rising of all Italians live in absolute poverty. But hunting gypsies provides a cheap scapegoat. The total immigrant numbers into Europe has dwindled to just 40,000 so far this year, but that hasn't stopped the vitriol from Salvini or from courts of Austria. It'll come as no surprise to hear Mary Le Pen send them back, she says. Different levels of affluence, the rising debt, unemployment amongst the young, and now a very real long-term threat of Turkey going rogue, and the inevitability of more African immigrants adds up to a potent challenge to a Europe already charged 
with bureaucratic obfuscation and inactivity. And the new members, struggling to find their feet, have added a new dimension to the problems. In monoracial Hungary, Viktor Orban has built his demagogy on attacking immigrants and liberal thinking. Orban oligarchs have taken over parts of the media in neighboring Slovenia and Macedonia to help the populist Slovenian Jansa come to power. In Poland, Jarosław Kaczynski, the dominant political figure, emotionally deranged by the death of his twin brother, has allied himself with Orban and Hungary and is busy disbanding the judiciary as a prelude to publishing his own brand of despotism. An East European populist cabal is form forming that could stabilize Europe. Wherever you look, Europe today is facing challenges. Perhaps the greatest is the emergence of this wholly new populist tone, one that traditional bureaucrats and old-style politicians simply do not seem to understand and will find, I believe, impossible to resist. In this context, Europe needs once more, if ever it could find it, the steadying hand of a strategically sophisticated and diplomatically commanding friend in the United States. But alas, this isn't there. It is though all the hounds of hell have been slipped free on the moment and no one is there to help. Above all, Europe needs strong new leaders of its own. British, Britain must stay. It must rever reverse its fatuous decision to leave. It needs a Thatcher. Recently released papers show the Iron Lady eventually changed her mind and saw the opportunity that Europe presents. In a 1988 letter, she wrote, we must get this right. Just think what a project this could be. A single market without barriers, direct access to 500 millions on our doorstep with a channel tunnel to give us direct access. Perhaps, she added, it's not a dream. Alas, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a Thatcher. Europe is in a crisis. Thank you for listening to me, and let me take any questions you'd now like to throw at me. Thank you for listening to me. Anybody on? You must have a question after all that lot. Yes, 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 in the back. The eventual survival of the EU. You've had this nationalism nurtured by the uh, lost ability to control their currency, their immigration, and their economic policy. Do you think that Italy, <coughs> with its resistance to Brussels' directives on economic policy, is a canary in the coal mine? <laughs> um, yes, I do. I think it's uh, very dangerous. Italy is in a very, very strange position. First of all, remember, <coughs> as you know only too well, uh, <coughs> remember the debt burden in Italy is large, uh, and Italy is a large economy. Greece has a greater debt burden, but relatively speaking, Greece is not so large. So if Italy is going to go, it's the uh, third largest economy in the EU. It matters. Secondly, it matters because banking started in Italy. It's a medieval construct. The reason they're called banks is because they used to do the money lending across a table called a banco. <coughs> and so um, Italy has these banks that have been going for centuries. The result is they have been offloading their debt, in particular into Sp Spanish banks, but into all banks throughout Europe. So if the Italian banks were to crash, the ripple effect will be instant. And I suspect it would affect American banks, especially with all the bankers here. I'm not an expert enough to know what the links would be in terms of American banks, but they would be not inconceivable, uh, not inconsiderate, whereas Greece would be a lesser event. But the second thing is how it illustrates what a crazy canary it is. Because the Italian politics today is almost incredible. A coalition has come together that represents the north, that's the affluent part, Milan, those sorts of areas, and the south, which is where the abject poverty really is. If you, we were in Rome the other day, and Rome is a mess. 
Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean in parks that you would normally walk around with with pleasure, there are now uh, rotting mattresses, there are transvestites, there are druggies, there are people who are um, mugging you. They're, the place is dangerous and the grass is up to here. Now, Rome and South are in trouble. So the second party represents them. The party that in the North is also fascist, so it's extremely right-wing. It wants to do what Trump has done here and cut taxes. Because, of course, everybody in the North, in, this, in the voting scene, is pretty affluent. So cutting taxes means everybody will be absolutely delighted. So they get elected, and they get, because of the Italian uh, way of doing the elections, they get a small percentage, around about 25%, which is enough to be critical. And so there they are, 25% with a, with a vote depending on cutting taxes. Down here, you're now talking about the extreme left. We're virtually talking about communists. So you've got, I'm, I'm, this is more extreme, I'm just making the point. You've like got fascists and communists. They win because they're going to say, we're going to have um, giveaways. We're going to give everybody $8,000. So of course, all the poor here have no option but to say, well, that's a great idea. I love the $8,000. So we're going to cut taxes and we're going to give away money. Now, that is just crazy. And not only that, they are now the coalition. So you have this uh, extreme opposites, two canaries, if you like, sitting in your, your cage. They then put forward a budget to the European Union because the idea in the European Union is to try and get some sort of control over this, that they will sanction the budget at the end of the day and in that budget, they are forecasting yet again a major loss that year. And so the European Union is faced with the question of what do we do now? Third most important economy in the European Union. They're saying to us effectively, <coughs> we're not taking any uh, attention to your disciplines. We are going to have a budget, which is a budget making a loss. And what's more, we're, it's incredible that it'll even happen because over here we're going to cut taxes, and down there we're going to sell them away. The European Union have to decide today. I think what they'll do is they'll kick the can down the road, and I think what we'll see is the can going down the road. But you can't kick it very far before you're going to get civil unrest in southern Italy. So your canary, I think, is absolutely right. If there's one country you want to watch, it's Italy. If it, if it breaks, it'll bring down Europe. Uh, and at the moment, it's not even a question of whether they're led well. The whole thing is conflicted. Is that on? <laughs> yeah, sir. Without. Well, <clears throat> funny enough, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly depressed. Uh, the trouble is this is like a, going into someone's house and it's a bad marriage and no one will believe anything anybody's saying any longer. Um, you wish you could only have been called in a decade earlier. Um, I think we really are in terrible trouble. But there is, you know, just a, a possible ray of sunlight there. Um, it's very instructive that although those states are fragmenting in Germany, and they're fragmenting on exactly the lines you'd expect, the Prussians, the South, the whole thing, in terms of what were the old states and how different they were in the 1870s. Um, it doesn't alter the fact that the real uh, party that's emerged is the Green Party. And the Green Party in Germany has become more than just worrying about climate change. At the heart <coughs> of the inevitability of the challenge facing Europe is climate change. If you look at a map when we were all kids and you looked at a map of the world, you would see around sort of a few inches down on the map in, of Africa, there would be a sort of yellowy bit which was showing you where the deserts were, where the Sahara is. That is going up north all the time. As that goes north, there is no hiding place. Those people have no option, and they have to go across the Mediterranean. So that is moving up. It is extraordinary how feeble, um, I mean, it's a gathering place now, thank goodness, but how feeble the reaction has been to climate change. Um, if you look at the problems, I'm, I'm uh, 
religiously determined not to criticize America. I, I think if, um, if you came over to Britain and you stood up and you criticized Britain, I think we might start throwing things. So I think if I come here and criticize America, you might start throwing things and they're more of you than me, so I don't want to do that. <coughs> but just remember, part of the problem in Honduras, part of the problem in what's going on in Latin America is, of course, exactly the same fragmentation in terms of a leadership, but it's also climate change. Honduras had an all-time record summer this year, so did Guatemala, so did all those countries across there, and it almost is like the key that opens the door. Uh, I think it had a, a three-degree um, increase in its record temperatures this year, and so suddenly farms were failing, crops were failing yet again. So this is a very big geopolitical, geoeconomic issue, and it's, it's not letting Europe off for one second. Yeah. Just, just speak up a fraction. Shifting back to the EU with your very unique perspective in politics, economics, and psychology, what is the high level way forward for the EU to stay together and have a partnership with the US and the rest of the world? <laughs> How long have we got? Right. Um, I actually think the only way you can do this is to say what would success look like. Um, I think we've gone too far. I think enlargement was a wonderful idea, and when you throw in Soviet Russia and what it achieved, um, it'd be very difficult to argue it was the wrong idea. <coughs> um, I, I think I'm a bit glib, as I was saying that. I thought, um, I'm sure I would have done the same thing. In fact, I think I did do the same thing. I think I was around in Europe at that time. Um, but it was a mistake. You can't, at the same time, have geoeconomic pressures with geopolitical pressures, it's, it's very, the tension becomes inevitable, unless they're all equal, which is a different game. So I think it'll look like uh, the original six, possibly with Britain. And I think there'll be a southern grouping, and I think Russia will move into the eastern states. And I think it's going to be very unpleasant. Now, if you think you've just got away from that uh, Russian influence and you've been influenced like that for so long um, I think it's going to be terrible I have no idea what you for example do about Bulgaria I mean $8,000 a year is the mean income um, that means you don't have things by the way it's worth just letting you know a little bit about what it's like it means in Greece right now um, they run out of anesthetics if you're going to think about going to, on a holiday to Greece, don't do it. You'll be absolutely crazy. You get a tet they may not have tetanus injections at the hospital you're at. The sort of things we all take for granted do not any longer happen in Greece. In Bulgaria, they never happened. And uh, I just can't see how... Uh, there isn't a leader around who's got this... The, De Gaulle was probably the last one. I can't see anybody else who's got that stature. Uh, I'm interested, quite fun enough, with these two sitting here. Um, what you really want is a president who can say to a few mates like a Mrs. Thatcher, why don't we all meet at Camp David and sort this out? What do we have to do? And the one thing you do not need to do is shout from the rooftops silly stuff about short-term trade, because that isn't helping anybody. Um, I mean, whether you agreed with it or not, it's neither here nor there. The issue is China. <clears throat> and we could have done another talk today about China. That's a trade issue. That's a totally different ballgame. That's a very different structure. But this is, it's really going to be difficult. And Italy is, could be the first. And when Italy goes, remember Italy was only formed 100 or so years ago. I mean, 1890 or something. Um, it'll go back to its component parts. I, I could see Italy fragmenting. Yes, sir. How do you see the turmoil in Europe impacting the U.S. and our um, If there are two answers. The first is we're self self-sufficient here. Um, we're a long way away. So I think to some extent you could 
turn a blind eye. It'll be costly, there's the half trillion you've invested, but I don't need to tell you about sunk, sunk debt and all that sort of thing. Um, so people could look away from that. Um, that's one route. The other sign, which is worth just reflecting on, is this. You trade with Europe hugely. And if you look at things like the American growth rate, what we're arguing about all the time is whether it's going to be 2%, 3%, or 4% 4 this year. We're not arguing about whether it's going to be 25 or 26%. Okay? So at the margin, trade with Europe becomes really important. Not only that, trade is a, uh, Europe is a buffer state to Russia. And again, I find the administration here's attitude to Russia quite impossible, as you can tell from this. This is what happened. Uh, Russia was all the time at, at our th throats in Europe. So, uh, first of all, you'd see trade being affected. If it really collapses, and I think it probably would, and I, I don't think this is something you can just compartmentalize. I, after all, so many other countries have these high interest rates as well. Uh, sorry, high debt rates. Um, so I think what you'd start to see would be trade going down. As that goes down, there will be a flight of capital from Europe into America. It's the obvious place to be. I mean, I think actually there's a coup for a bank right now, which is <laughs> the next 18 months to two years. As people in Europe who've got any money say, if, if someone will buy my house, I'll go and buy a house in Vero Beach. I, mean, I think there will be that flood of money coming in. I could even see a blip in the stock market. And of course, everybody will take credit for that. But actually, what it'll be is this money coming in. So I could see that happening. But Europe is also the major trading partner with Japan. And Japan's market is utterly flat. If that stopped, I could see Japan crashing. Japan is your other big trading partner. And so what we're all talking about at the moment when we put our heads together is the most horrendous domino theory. And you'd start with Italy, you'd then go Europe, you'd then go Japan, and then boys and girls, we put our heads down because it'll come whistling in here. So I think this is terribly significant. You can't get away from, I don't think you can afford to say it's not our fight. Can I take any more questions? I've got one more for you. Yep. So how long is it going to be from the time that it goes from capitalism to socials and the communism? Because you're basically saying that there, you're, the European nation is heading to uh, socialism and communism. Do you know, I almost didn't use that word. Um, no, no, and I, I, I need to rephrase it. Uh, socialism means something in Europe that it doesn't mean here. Socialism here means communism. What I think you're going to see is um, if, if you can pull off the European adventure, it will be that there will have to be a better distribution of um, money. Because at the end of the day, the, the countries are so much smaller uh, and the have have not. The have and have not's problem here is enormous. You know, the 0.1% control whatever percentages of the assets of America. It, we've all got this problem in, in, in Europe because the general uh, economic health is not as powerful as it is here. It's even worse to have the poverty. Um, how long does it take? It'll be very quick. You're, you see, what I think you're going to see is civil wars. That's what I'm afraid of. Oh, God. Uh, this is all going to happen within the next 18 months to three years. Yes, sir. You stayed away from Spain. If, if Italy is fragmented, I was thinking. Sorry. If Italy is fragmented, then Spain. Yeah. I believe Spain would pull right behind Italy. Yes. Yes, because the banking system would collapse as well. Yes, you're absolutely right. Bank Santander, uh, you'll know better than anybody else. Um, what's, what's, what's the level of uh, exposure of in Bank Santander into Italy? They're loaded with uh, bad paper. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know the... It's going to be 30 or 40%. I mean, it's huge, isn't it? Yeah. And so that would, that would crash. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to be hogging it. Any more questions for James? Thank you. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you.
I think it yeah. seems to have gone down well. I think it's the accent. Good. Hi, I'm Bill Penny, President and CEO of Marine Bank. And again, I want to say, wow, wasn't that fascinating? That was awesome. Uh, two clarifications. First, community banks didn't so cause the financial crisis. <laughs> we were victims as well. And we have no Italian debt or European debt in any of our portfolios. Right, Charlie? I'm looking at my CFO. <laughs> I looked at those that were yielding 18%, and I tried to buy some, but he, he turned me down. So thank you for keeping me in line. Again, thank you all for coming out and sharing your morning with us. Before we depart, if I can have about two minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about Marine Bank, and then we have a couple of door prizes. As uh, Steve said earlier, Marine Bank is the only bank headquartered right here in Vero Beach. What that means to you is you're dealing directly with the decision makers. They're all in this room. So if you have a loan going, you need to start job owning on somebody here. But we do make the local decisions right here, very different than most other banks. We've been serving uh, Indian River County and now Melbourne since 1997. Yes, 21 years. No name change. It's nice and boring. We, we don't like the drama of the changes like that, and our customers like that as well. I'm very fortunate to work with a team of seasoned and passionate bankers. Again, so many of them are in this room. You know, I, I thank, thank them every day, and I, I look in the mirror and I say, Bill, don't screw it up, because you work with amazing people. So to all the marine bankers, thank you all so much. We live here, we're very committed to continually improving our community that we love, and we're also committed to helping you improve your business by offering events such as this. So again, we hope you enjoyed it. When you do well, we do well. And finally, I want to close out by saying I guarantee if you bank with us, you're going to get the best banking service you ever had. And if you don't, call me. And I offer that up every time, every speech. And I, really, I get a lot of calls, but never about that. So uh, again, our, our team is doing very well. So this past Saturday, I was wandering around the Vero Beach Book Center in the business section. And lo and behold, found some books on understanding leaders by James Cook. I found they, were, they had three, I bought them all, I kept one for myself, and I've got two as door prizes. So James, if I can have you uh, pull out a couple cards. You got two? Okay. Yep. Wanna read them out? Yeah. They like your accent better than mine. All right. This is, uh, crikey, Peter O'Brien. Peter O'Brien. And Dorothy Hudson. Thank you, and I imagine you can get your book autographed. Peter, here you go, thank you. And uh, Dorothy, here you go. And with that, I want to close out. Thank you all very much for coming out this morning. James, thank you. Let's give James one more big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.